So welcome everyone. I'm going to put up this a little um, PowerPoint slide and then um, we're just going to get started because I think there's going to be a lot to talk about today. And then um, so I'll hold off on the introductions until each person does their presentation. I hope that's okay with everyone. So I'm going to share my screen. Hold on. Why is it not showing up? Okay. This is a control F. I can never forget which screen. Which which um Okay. Can you guys see? Yes. So welcome everyone to this presentation on fiscal management for AVERS programs. Um, we are fortunate and very happy to have our collaborators and our friends at Western Washington and the Tribal VR Institute at Northwest Indian College. We have Rachel Allen. She is a TVR Institute faculty with the Northwest Indian College TVR Institute. She's also a Tribal VR director. I'll wait for her. She can introduce herself later on. We also have Elizabeth, Dr. Elizabeth Bolin. She's with Western Washington University and she's the assistant director of the TVR Institute. Also on, we have Dr. Lee Gastioma, who is the director of the Aver TAC um, program mm -hmm. at NEU, Institute for Human Development, and myself, Winona Reed. So welcome everyone. We have some learning objectives that we wanted to accomplish today. Um, the first one is the increased awareness of best practices and in strengthening internal controls and meeting the match cost share requirements. Um, a lot of times when you are operating a program, especially if you're a new director, you're not quite sure of some of the things that you have at your disposal or what you can control in, in fiscal management um, scenarios. Um, also, you know, who are your friends in the tribal VR world? Who are your friends within your tribal infrastructure that can help you be in compliance? Um, another big thing is that the tribal VR programs are um, required to have a 10% match. And so we're going to discuss how, how can you go about um, addressing that match and cost share requirement. We're also going to have, um, you're going to also um, hopefully have an increased knowledge of the Northwest Indian College TBR Institute Financial Management Toolkit. And Beth and Rachel are going to share that toolkit with us. It's very, very important that all of you guys go through that and finish it. It's really an excellent toolkit for you guys. Um, I've been working with Tribal VR for a long time and or with Tribal VR for a long time. And I wish that they had this toolkit a long time ago. I think it's, it, it would have caught, it would have um, resulted in a lot of success with a lot of tribal VR programs that were in, in some issues and some problems. The third learning outcome is um, increased understanding of grant management, including the understanding the grant cycle, cost principles, and the UM, OMB uniform guidance, which is always fun. So I'm just going to go right into it, you guys, and then I'm going to finish and I'll let you guys go into the um, financial management toolkit, okay? What is financial management? So that you probably hear a couple of definitions from this throughout this presentation, as well as several examples. And um, you'll probably hear of some key terms over and over. So take note of those because at the end of this webinar, I'm hoping that we have a little bit of time to do a little exercise that I have planned. So fiscal management is the process of planning, directing, and controlling financial resources and the management of those responsibilities for expenditures. You have a obligation when you receive federal, federal funds to be, to be aware of rules and regulations and to be aware of what you can and cannot do with those federal dollars. And um, so you have the tribal rules and regulations, you have some laws that are in there. You also have what was noted in the application kit, as well as your award notice, and of course, all those other rules and regulations. So it's important to understand 
the many strings attached to these grant funds to ensure compliance with tribal fiscal rules and comply with federal regulations. And fiscal management is essential to the long-term success of the AVERS program. And once you, I feel that once you, um, I, I'll tell you a story about when I started in with grant writing and stuff like that. And I had this long time friend of mine and she said, I, I, give you, I give you five years. You don't know nothing in the first five years. And I was like so offended that she said that to me. And I was like, what does she mean by that? She goes, you're not gonna know anything your first five years. You're gonna have to go through it and you're gonna have to go your, your ups and downs and you're gonna have to um, go through a little bit of trial and error and make some mistakes. And it was so true because probably within, after those five years, I looked back and I was like, I was so green, I was so fresh and I didn't, I, I didn't know nothing. And I felt like I didn't really feel comfortable with grants and contracts or the grant writing world probably until like eight years. It took a long, long time to just kind of know what the history of those rules and regulations are and what you can and cannot do and who my friends were and who had my back and who I can call through, call to in a jam. And, um, so it takes a little bit of time. And I hope that all of you who are new directors go through this process knowing that you're not going to have to know everything within those first three months or that first year. It's going to take a little bit of time to understand all the, all the little intricacies of the grant writing, grant management, the fiscal management, the program management, programmatic manage, management of your program. Okay. So Take it easy on yourself. <laughs> Someone, June Christ is trying to get in. So I just wanted to start off a little bit about the uniform guidance. And so the uniform guidance, the official term is the uni uniform administrative requirements, cost principles, and audit requirements for federal awards. You can find it at ecfr.gov. And it's the final, the final rule was made on December 26, 2014. And it goes by a few names. Um, can't say some of them on here, but <laughs> it used to be called the super circular or the omnibus circular, but it can also be called the two CFR part 200. I put a little picture of my book that I have on my desktop. It's a desktop reference. It's nice and purple, my favorite color. We used to use, we used to all always call it UG, UG. <laughs> and we never understood why they called it the uniform guidance. But anyway, it consolidated um, several circulars into one, which is a great idea. It's just that there were all different, um, you know, people or institutions involved in it, and it just became very confusing. So, for example, the A21 is higher education, A87 is the tribes, and then you have the A131, which are the audits. So combining them all into one circular was kind of a, a chore and um, can get confusing, but it's all in there now. And I suggest you guys read some of it. It's kind of enlightening. So the uniform guidance is separated into six main subparts. Subpart A are the acronyms and the definitions. Um, B is the general provision. C are the pre-federal award requirements and contents of federal awards. D is post-federal requirements, post-federal award requirements. E is the cost principles and F are the auto requirements. And for you guys as tribal VR programs, I, I believe that you guys mainly should be looking at subpart A, which are the acronyms and the definitions. And the D is the post-federal um, award requirements, as well as cost principles and audit requirements. There's some really good information in there. So we're going to pretty much cover a little bit of A and mainly um, subpart E today, okay? So some of the definitions that I want you guys to be aware of is, um, the first one is match and cost sharing. So in, in your application, the definition of cost sharing is um, means 10% of the total cost of the project. And in the uniform, and you can see where it is noted in the CFRs, and in the uniform guidance, 
cost sharing or matching is defined as the means the mean, means the proportion of project costs not paid by federal funds unless otherwise authorized by federal statute. So you can also see um, 200.306 for cost sharing and matching. So we're gonna have a little, kind of like a little breakout later on. And we're gonna talk about ways that you guys um, document match and cost share, and we can share all of those. Um, it's a requirement, you have to do it. And some programs have a really good, um, easy way of doing it. They get just cash up front. And some programs, they don't have that luxury of having cash. They, they have to figure out a way they're going to come up with their match, okay? So it is a requirement and it's important to understand. One term that I feel like gets confused and gets tied into match and cost share is in-kind. And in-kind is totally, totally different. And I have not really gotten um, a clear answer yet. So you guys probably know this answer, so you guys are gonna answer for me, but I think it's important in this context of defining, um, having the definition. So in-kind means, or third-party in-kind means the value of non-cash contributions, property or services, and that benefits a federally assisted project or program and are contributed by non-federal third parties without charge. So there are some programs that will have a in-kind, meaning that they'll have like some sort of outside charity or I've seen churches and they contribute something to the program that helps offset costs. That's considered an in-kind. That's not a match or cost share. And so um, I just wanted to put that out there because I hear, I hear the kind of the, the, defin the, the terms thrown together a lot and they're completely two different things. So I'm not quite 100% positive that the tribal VR programs can have in kind. Yeah, and we'll, we'll go over that one, Nona, okay. because it's actually considered part of their match. So they can oh, use okay. in kind contributions as part of their match. And so we'll, yep, we'll talk about okay. that. Cool, thank you. So I just wanted to also um, say that in, in your annual performance report, the first thing that you are reporting on is your budget. So the budget is important as far as managing everything because you're going to be reporting it every single year and you're going to be reporting on it in your final report as well as all the other things listed here. And then just kind of throw out there, where, where do you address the budget in your grant? Well, it's noted, there's some parts of it is noted in your abstract when you're talking about the percentage of time the director is on the grant and gets committed to it. You're talking about how, um, what is the number of individuals who receive services under an IPE each budget period and the proposed number who will obtain employment outcomes for each budget period. You're also kind of loosely talking about the budget when you're, when you're um, responding to the quality of management plan. And then of course you have your federal and non-federal budget, the ED524, and you have your budget narrative, which I feel is really, really important when you're talking about fiscal management and how you wrote certain things into the budget, okay? How did you define it? How did you describe it in your budget narrative is very, very important. Kind of like a balancing act. You don't wanna give, give too much information where it puts you in a corner, but also you don't want to have it loose where you're constantly being questioned by your financial people or your accounting people or your grants and, off, grants and contracts office or even the federal funder. You want to be clear and succinct, but not too detailed where, <laughs> so it's a balancing act. And then of course, there's that little bit of part in your application for federal assistance, the SF-424. So some internal controls that I wanted to talk about really quick um, because I think it's very, very important is when you're a director, either long-term standing or um, brand new, you need to establish some sort of comfortable internal controls um, in order to make sure that you're reporting accurately, making sure that no one's taking advantage of the program and just um, basic budgeting practices. So how are you improving accountability of the program? Are you training your staff? Are you being trained yourself? Um, what kind of communications do you have with your financial office and your grants and contracts so that you're improving accountability 
and that when someone asks about how is your program being accountable, you can respond to that. A lot of times people don't know how, you know, especially in the grant world, it's like, how, how is it being managed within the tribe and within the program? So do you have a shadow budget? Um, how, what kind of system is the tribe using as far as keeping track of those dollars? And then um, some internal controls is helping the program achieve performance and budget targets. You know, are you, how, are you meeting with your people 50%, like 50% six months down the road or at the end of the year? And are you um, working with your project officer and maybe moving dollars across line items so that you're, expend, you, you're expending your dollars? You weren't, you, weren't planning, you weren't planning for COVID, okay? So now you have this high turnover. So really look at how you are managing your budget. And then how are you improving the reliability of your financial reporting? And that's the reporting that you get, especially on your five-year report. Um, I've noticed that the programs that I've been working with is the, um, the reports that they get from their financial office. They're not quite sure what it means. And so looking at those financial reports so that you are reporting accurately and you're working together because you have to work with your business office or your financial office in, um, in those reports, okay? And how, how are you improving compliance as far as establishing those, those policies and procedures that are required by your program? How are you improving compliance within just um, being a director and having those checks and balances of those dollars? So think about um, how, how are you having internal controls with your program? And then lastly is the pre preventing the loss of public trust. And this was kind of like a big, a big deal while I worked in, um, in sponsored projects as well as when I worked in health sciences at U of A, is that you do not want to lose the public trust. That is so, so important. And it goes, it's, I think it's very, very important in tribal communities because you don't want to have someone on the outside having, you know, spreading rumors on the moccasin trail, you know. They want, you want to be able to defend your grant dollars and how you spent it, how you went about it. Defend that, you know, sometimes a um, consumer may get a snowmobile, but not every consumer is going to get a snowmobile. There are reasons why certain consumers may get a snowmobile or uh, a, uh, another high ticketed item, part of their case dollars. So it's being very, very um, um, clear in, in your rules and regulations, what you can do and being stern in what you're, how you're spending your dollars. And so, um, you know, you just don't wanna lose the public trust. And I can tell you a story of, it wasn't our institution, but it was a, something that my previous director always brought up, and it was a, a faculty member that um, used federal funds and the newspaper got hold of it and they put it out there and it caused a lot, a lot of issues and problems for that university because they had to return those dollars to the funder and, um, and there was a lot of repercussions after that. So be very, very careful. We, we say this with love and <laughs> admiration for your program, and we want you guys to be the best programs out there, okay? So your accounting system um, within your tribe and even just looking at your internal budget is, um, is you want to be able to distinguish between what is a grant and non-grant related expenditure. So within your tribe, um, their financial system are they able to say that your grant dollars specifically was, um, was, was spent using grant dollars or were they being used by federal, other federal funds? So were the costs charged appropriately? So if an auditor comes in, an outside person came in and looked at the expenditures, they knew exactly where those dollars were coming, go, coming in and how they were being expended, okay? Then there's the identifying costs from program year especially when there's multi-year projects like you guys, is that you guys are able to identify certain costs. Yes, these dollars went to supplies to this consumer or this travel cost went to, these, went to this person to attend the KNAR conference or these costs were um, specific to a consultant. 
So you can identify costs when in the, within a budget. So is it sometimes when you look at your, I know it happens to me, <laughs> sometimes you look at your bank account, if you haven't looked at it for like maybe a month, and you see this cost and you're like, oh my gosh, what is that? Where did I spend $58? And there's no amount. It's just like a little a number that goes on there. So I have to go back and say, what did I spend $58 on three weeks ago that I don't even know what it was? It's that kind of thing. It's like you, you know where your money is within your system and how to identify it, okay? And then identifying costs by budget categories. That's really nice for an auditor because they're able to identify and match up, oh, so all, most of the budget is not going to personnel, it's going to other areas. So they're able to identify dollars that are spent in the budget categories. And then also differ, differentiating between direct and indirect costs. So because of how the indirects are charged, sometimes it looks like it can be a direct cost when really it's an indirect or vice versa. So we wanna make sure that your travel accounting system is, um, can identify them separately clearly. And then accounting for each award grant separately. You don't ever want, there has been cases where there have been um, mainly like in the nonprofit world and foundations where they just kind of put all the money into a pool. <laughs> and you don't want to do that. You want to be able to say that your grant is being uh, tracked and being expended separately from all other grants and awards because you want to be again, identify those expenditures, okay? And then also the easily provide financial reports, a summary or detail. That's really important when you're coming down to your annual report and you're asking for those, for those questions that they're asking in, in the report, you want to be able to get it right away and answer it, okay? So I'm going to kind of go through the cost principles really quick because I don't know if Beth and them are going to go through these. Do you guys go through cost principles, Beth? Yeah, we've, yeah, we, and we've got, yeah, we're going to cover a lot of what you just covered too. So that's okay. So I'm just going to go through the cost principles really quick. Um, you know, they're of course reasonable and that it's under the uniform gu guidance under point four is 404. And it's about being, you know, how does not exceed in which would be incurred by a prudent person or person under circumstances prevailing at the time of the decision. So it's being a prudent person at the time of um, that purchase. And it's being allocable, allowable, and consistently treated. So I'll let those guys do that. And then I'm going to end with um, connecting some of those um, topics with your policies and procedures. So you may have a lot of different policies and procedures, but the four that are mainly required by the travel VR programs are these four. The one is off reservation services, two is payment for services, three is duration of services, and four is the authorization of services. So the first one in regards to um, fiscal management that I wanted to bring up is the off reservation services. And in this policy procedure, it specifically says, establish a preference for on or near reservation without denying an individual's necessary services. If an individual chooses an equivalent off reservation service at a higher cost than an available on or near reservation service, the TVR unit is not responsible for the cost and access of the cost of the on or near reservation services if either service would meet the individual's needs. So that's why it's important to really have clear policies and procedures in regards to specific fiscal management that, that is not the same as other programs within your tribe. This is very specific to a travel VR program, okay? Um, I don't think there was anything else. And then of course the payment for services. Um, written policies to govern the rates of payment for all purchase VR services, meaning that you want to establish a fee schedule designed to ensure the TVR pays a reasonable cost for each service, as long as the fee schedule is one, not so low as effectively to die an individual and necessary service, and permits exceptions so that individual needs can be addressed. And then three, the TVR may not place absolute dollar limits on the amount it will pay for specific service categories or the total services provided to individual. And it always, I always feel like the 
the fiscal or the uh, financial people in your in your tribe probably like what what does that mean <laughs> so um, it's just making sure that you're you're not putting um, limits on services and limits on dollars but you also have a fee schedule to kind of give you a marker a uh, benchmark of how you're spending dollars so it's kind of like it's there but it's not there kind of thing and then i'll call of course the duration is the same thing i'm not going to go into that and then the authorization of services do you have anything to say lee no not at this time thank you for asking so i'm going to pass it off to rachel and elizabeth I see all the chats. Sorry, guys, I wasn't looking at the chats. <laughs> okay. And uh, can you see my screen? Yep. Uh, yep. Beautiful. PowerPoint. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so Rachel and I are joining you today on behalf of the Tribal Vogue Rehab Institute. And I think most of you know by now, since we're in year five, that it's a joint venture between Northwest Indian College and Western Washington University. Uh, so my name, if you don't know me, um, Beth Boland. I am the assistant director, like Winona said, of the Voc Rehab Institute. Um, I also direct the rehabilitation counseling program at Western Washington University. Uh, Rachel, do you want to give a quick intro and then I'll move into the sure. slides? So I'm Rachel Allen and like Beth had mentioned, um, I am an instructor for the TVR Institute and I've taught several of the courses online. Um, I would, I believe it's been about two years that I've been an instructor um, and have enjoyed that and, and really enjoy interacting with all the different TBR staff and some other individuals who aren't necessarily in TBR but maybe used to be or want to be. And um, I have off and on about 14 years of experience in Tribal Voc Rehab as a counselor and as a director and I look forward to sharing some information with you today. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. So we're going to kind of go back and forth. Um, and obviously, we will, you know, send these slides to the AverTAC folks so they can send it out um, to the participants after the presentation. So just put our web address there. This is the, just the General Institute web address. So if you want more information about us. Um, and like Winona said, as part of our grant, we established this toolkit. And so RSA asked us to create this TVR financial management toolkit. And the goal of the toolkit was really to help newer established TVR directors quickly and easily move through those steps that Winona was going through. Um, and the toolkit is designed in modules. So it's within our Canvas learning management system that the college uses. And so um, there's different modules that are in there and then in each module are kind of steps. And so we, we took it in a logical order that you'll see from kind of the beginning of the grant, you know, through doing certain things. Um, and there are examples and resources provided. And so the link to the um, financial management toolkit is below. And let me, I'm gonna see if I can share, I have to make it share the financial management toolkit. Um, so hopefully you can see the financial management toolkit there. Um, so this is what you would see when you come into that link. And then there's different modules. And so I'm going to go quickly through each module, but this is what it looks like. And so there's a, a how to use this toolkit if you haven't used Canvas or tool, this toolkit before. And then we go through different modules. And so today, Rachel and I are going to cover about, I can't see the link. Um, it's on the PowerPoint slide, the, the link. Um, and I don't know if um, I put the link in the, um, chat as well, but it's it's on the PowerPoint slide too. Um, and so if I can go back to my PowerPoint. Um, so like I said, the link is at the bottom of the PowerPoint slide there. 
So just as an overview of the toolkit before we get into some specific steps, the first module is called setting the foundation. And so this is really where you're defining tribal voc rehab. So if you're brand new to the TBR, AVRS grants, so looking at some of those, that information, what to review in those grant documents and what sort of things that you should pay attention to. A little information about tribal and agency organization structure and a little conversation about tribal partners. Module two are building blocks. Yep, thanks Rachel, I was in the modules. <laughs> That's why the link was like that. Um, so building blocks, so really just some history, some regulatory guidance, um, information about complying with reporting requirements, information about program evaluation, data management system, program policies and procedures, and some forms, um, ex examples of some forms. Uh, module three, setting up the financial management system. So step one is establishing that initial budget, which we'll go over today, um, setting up financial tracking, which we'll go over today, and then some budgetary considerations and audits. Module four is actually then spending agency funds. And so reviewing regulatory and criteria for expenditures, which we're gonna go over today. And then step two, establishing and maintaining fiscal protocols and policies, which is another area that we're gonna go over. And then information about establishing vendors and service providers and purchasing participant services. And then if we go, you know, then module five really looks at caseload management. And this is caseload management from a director point of view, not from an individual counselor point of view. And so really looking at how, as a director, do you review case files? Um, so talking about regular case file review practices, um, a little information about participant services, and then best practices for caseload data management. So really taking that bird's eye view of the cases that your staff are working with. And then module six has to do with staff supervision. And so because we were asked to do financial management, we felt that this was also a piece of this because as you know, when there's a lot of turnover in staff that increases your costs and increases your stress of your staff and decreases motivation. And there's some you know, ramifications that are financially uh, are tied to that financial management. So just some information about hiring staff, different positions in agencies that you might see, um, policies, supervision, um, some information about teamwork, organizational development. Again, a conversation about planning and preventing staff turnover. So, you know, you can't completely ignore that you're gonna have staff turnover. So part of that is planning for that. And then a section on staff self-care that you as a director can assist with. Um, so like I said, Rachel and I are gonna go through a few of the steps in the modules. So the first one is establishing the budget. So um, most of you know this because you're, uh, working with us every day, but obviously you have a finite funding that's awarded each year by RSA. And so that's why budgeting is so important because you need to stay within that finite dollar amount. And this is detailed in that grant award notice or the GAN. And so if you haven't seen the GAN, you wanna make sure that you see that because it does detail the uh, funding, the levels of you know, percent of the key personnel, um, and a lot of other information. And so if you haven't seen the, your GAN for your award, I would highly suggest that you look at that. And it is the director's responsibility to allocate those funds. And so as a director, you have that responsibility to make sure that you're establishing, maybe establishing that agency if you're a new grantee, or if you're coming in as a new director, it might be just to look at what's already in place and see if there's some ways that you might want to um, change the structure. And then you're also you know, really responsible to make sure that you're managing those participant services. And so making sure that the dollars are going as far as they can so that all of your participants um, are getting you know, the services that they need. And then sound financial management is imperative. And Winona you know, went over that quite a bit. Um, for purposes of this presentation, I'm going to not do the questions right now until, you know, to make sure that we have enough time. Um, and like Wayne said, if you have questions or comments, please put them in the chat box or raise your hand. So if we think about 
um, reviewing and converting the grant budget. And so RSA or the Department of Education has particular categories of money that they give you. So personnel, uh, benefits, you know, equipment, supplies, those sorts of things. But sometimes that doesn't fit well into your particular tribal financial system. And so um, the budget in the grant proposal is typically more broad than that. And we'll go over um, some examples in a minute about um, what your budgets might look like from your tribe. And so this is why it's again important, and Winona stressed this as well, that you partner with your tribal finance folks because you want to make sure that you are accurately translating what the federal categories are into your tribal finance categories. And really to partner with the tribal finance to identify those critical unique tribal components and then clarify indirect costs. And so we'll go you know, through this a little bit more. Um, so first match, and so Winona talked about this. Um, so it's a 10% match calculated from the total project cost, but the total project cost is not just your federal dollars. It's your federal dollars plus the match, and it's this formula that was a little bit complicated to first get my head around. Um, and fortunately, RSA has a match calculator. And so I just wanted, in case you guys haven't seen this, um, let me see. Can you see the match calculator now? Um, so assuming you can. Um, so thank you, Nicholas. Um, so here's the web page that that link brings you to. And so if you want to calculate the minimum non-federal match required, click on that arrow to go down. And then the most important thing, it auto defaults to VOC Rehab State Grants because that's the first grant listed in the drop-down menu. So what you wanna make sure is click on that drop-down menu and choose the type of grant that you have. And so um, most, if not all of you, would be choosing the AIVRS grants. And then you just put in a federal amount. Let's just say, I'm just making up numbers, but let's just say 500,000 and then you calculate the minimum match. And it's going to tell you that your non-federal share or that match share must be at least $55,556. Okay, so that's an easy way to figure out your match. Let me go back to PowerPoint. Um, so that's, you know, so the, the link is in here. There's some more information um, in the financial management toolkit as well. One of the other things that I wanted to talk to you about too is um, just the in-kind. And so Winona talked about that um, in our toolkit, we have this, um, example. And so this is an example of a sample in-kind contribution form that you can use to verify that you are getting in-kind. Because like Winona said, the in-kind is really, you know, you don't have cash that you're putting into your account. You're getting something from someone else that you're not paying for, but it could be space from your tribal program. It could be um, using like with the TVR grant, part of our match comes from the college's IT that we get to use a piece of an IT person. And so this is just a general form and you know, this is just an example. So you would want to make sure it fits your needs, but it's really good practice to have some sort of verification form for these in-kind matches. So if any, there was ever any audit that you can be easily pull this up. And so this form just shows, you know, the program, the year, the contact people, and then really the most important part is that description. So description of whatever the in-kind cost is, uh, which quarter you got it in, and what the fair market value is. And you may wanna have um, you know, descriptor of, of where you got that fair market value because it could be several years from now that they're asking for this audit. And so obviously, um, if you think about office space, fair market value changes um, probably on a quarterly basis. And so you wanna make sure that you're providing a good source for that. 
form. So that's just an example. This is available through the toolkit if you want to go back and look at that. Um, so, Suzanne, you had a pro um, you had uh, asked about a discussion on provision of a resource on indirect cost. Did you want to add to that question or make sure that I covered everything? Um, I just want to, um, the indirect cost rate, um, I work with some programs that it's really, really high. So who's said Oh, yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm sorry to cut you off. I was thinking match. We're going to go to indirect cost in a minute. <laughs> So I think that might be our next. <laughs> there we go. Now we have indirect cost. So, so now, um, go ahead, Suzanne. It was the uh, what I was saying is that the indirect cost rate is really high. Can mm -hmm. it be waived? Um, who sets it? Um, and a little bit more understanding of. Because when you're looking at direct costs, indirect costs, and match, how do they weave themselves together? Mm -hmm. Right, right. So indirect costs are really those, it's called a facilities and administration or F&A cost. And it's, it's things that support your grants that cannot be claimed as direct cost. So a direct cost has to be unique to your particular program or agency. It's not shared with other programs. It's paid directly with grant funds. And so examples can be client service dollars, wages of people who are 100% with the IVRS program, um, salaries, you know, that sort of thing. Some examples of indirect costs might be um, if you're in a shared building. So it might be, you know, the cost of that building space. Um, it could be electricity, it could be phone service, it could be an internet service. So those sorts of things that are shared with other departments and programs in the tribe are part of that indirect cost. And like Suzanne said, most tribal programs have an indirect cost already negotiated with the federal government. And so you'll need to find that. Um, sometimes they'll have different rates for different types of programs. And so this again is why you really need to partner with your financial people in your tribe to make sure that you are um, using the right indirect cost. But yes, that can be you know, a big chunk of money on, you know, off the top of client service dollars in your grant budget. And then how does the indirect costs differ from match because mm -hmm. they're very similar. Right. My understanding is that the tribe gets X amount of dollars, that it belongs to the tribe, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, and then they have to get an in, in uh, a rate and um, we're talking in some cases, the rate is so high, it really does impact um, services, so. This is really uh, troublesome for me, <laughs> but I'll just go here. Thank you. Yeah, yep. So I would just say, um, you know, talk to your um, RSA project officer as well, because there are some times that you can ask. Um, so I'm just, I have my the toolkit pulled up and we have a statement in here saying unrecovered indirect costs including indirect costs and in-kind match may be included as part of in-kind match only with prior approval of the RSA project officer. So unrecovered indirect costs means the difference between the amount charged to the federal award and the amount which could have been charged to the federal award under the tribal organization's approved negotiated indirect cost rate. And so when I read that, what, what I hear it saying is that you could talk to your um, fiscal agency to get a different rate for your program and the difference there could be then used as in, you know, as match. But anytime you're doing those sorts of things, you would certainly want to contact your RSA project officer prior to doing any of those. Well, I don't think the tribe would be happy <laughs> with um, a director or manager using mm -hmm. the dollar amount they're receiving if they're receiving a high dollar amount. I mean, this right. really, it really gets convoluted. Um, mm -hmm. 
and the people that suffer are those trying to provide services. So yep. Um, anyway. Definitely, Very definitely. Yeah. Yep. Um, and just remember as well, and this you know sometimes it's confusing for new directors that the indirect cost rate may be set up with somebody a uh, different federal department like health and human services is a common one and so but whatever indirect cost rate you have negotiated with one federal agency like um, health and human services it goes for all of them and so just because these grants are coming from department of ed you still use that indirect cost rate that's been negotiated with the other you know federal department Me just bring the sorry I'm just trying to bring the chat back up I collapsed it <laughs> um, so if we think about fund accounting so this is a type of accounting method that's used by a lot of different places so it's not a tribal specific type of accounting and so um, but most a lot of tribes are using what's called fund accounting and so this is where each department or program or agency has an account number that's specific to the dollar that grant coming in and then each expenditure type has its own code and so the grant award is considered the fund and then the budget in the grant needs to be converted. So in our toolkit, we have some examples of these. Um, let me bring them up. Oops. To choose the right screen. I have so many screens open right now that I have to make sure I choose the right one. So this is a one example. Um, and so you can see that this has converted the personnel into the specific, you know, you probably have specific names under program director and the VRCs. Let me just make this bigger. Um, and then you have the benefits section, you have, and then you have other things broken up, travel, conference fees, you know, office supplies, program supplies, participant services. So this may be your operating budget here. And then when you think about, um, your fund accounting, this could be what it looks like. And so you see these 5100, 5130, 5210, those are numbers that come right from your fiscal office. And so your finance department, again, has these expenditure types having their own code. And so that's a way to make sure that when you're charging for a particular service or for travel or for salary, that you're going against the correct code so that your fiscal office and your tribe knows how to charge that money. And so um, a lot of times what the directors do, and you're probably all very familiar with this, is that when you go and do your annual reports or any reporting that you need to do to RSA, you collapse those then categories or those codes into the federal um, categories. And so that's just what fund accounting means. And so, um, yeah, this is just an example of this particular tribe's breakup. So you can see it um, has a lot of different numbers and it's not going to be from tribe to tribe. And so, you know, if Rachel talked to one of her counterparts in a different tribe and said, well, I'm charging, you know, $163,000 to code number 8100, they probably have different codes. And so, um, you know, you need to know how to transfer that um you know with in your tribe and be able to explain you know what that might be um and then just a little bit about budget modifications and so first and foremost if you're getting a new grant you need to look to see did your requested amount change from your actual grant award and so if it did, then you'll need to work with your tribal program and your RSA project officer to um, make sure that you, know, you modify the budget accordingly if there's less dollars that you're given. And then there's changes you know, throughout the five-year cycle of your grant that may have to happen. And so if you have some of these um, activities like a change in scope or objectives, change in key personnel, dis director disengagement, um, cost requiring private approval, 
from those uniform guidance principles, um, transferring money, transferring big amount of money, that's when you need to get those um, prior approvals from your RSA project officer. There are changes though that you can do without approval. So if there's cost of living increases, promotions, those sorts of things, generally don't require prior approval, but RSA wants to emphasize to err on the side of caution. And so they would rather have you run it past them and they say you didn't need to run it past you, know, you rather than getting caught in an edit or an audit situation. So that's the that step. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop sharing, and then Rachel's going to take over. Give me just a second to grab my screen here. Make sure it's on the right one before I do. <clears throat> okay, are you able to see my screen safe financial tracking? Yes. Wonderful. All right, so after the budget has been established, then tracking expenditures is, of course, incredibly important as well. And um, if your program doesn't already have a system, or maybe the previous system wasn't working the way that you would like for it to, then um, getting a, a good system established can make all the difference and like Beth was just talking about the different categories or for some of us we call it the line items um, fund codes there are a number of different terms that all come into play here and and it's really important to have that um, good relationship like we've already been talking about with your finance department or your business department because it can reduce a lot of confusion if everybody's using different terms for the same information, the same um, topics like fund codes, line items, and, and all of those uh, accounting terms that they may be more comfortable and uh, used to, and as a new director, or if they're coming in from another location that used those terms and maybe previous um, staff members in your finance department didn't use those terms, but now all of a sudden somebody is, um, don't hesitate to ask and make sure that there's understanding so that there's not having to go back and backtrack and correct things later if uh, that relationship and the terminology was established earlier in the process because that can cause further delay and confusions and possibly mistakes that you'll have to go back and, and fix. So one, one system that um, can be helpful is using it like a, a checking account, keeping your documents similar to a, a cash, I mean a, a check register that you would get from your bank um, when you have a checkbook. That's one way and um, you should be regularly getting report, reports from what the documents are from your finance department or your business department so that you can compare. You should be tracking everything that is spent for the program on your end and keeping that document up to date. Um, recommended, you know, very frequently. You don't want to try to go back and backtrack and enter things only maybe monthly or quarterly because you have more likelihood to have mistakes and things that are accidentally left out. Um, so the more frequently that you can keep that up to date, then the better. And then when they send you their report, then you um, basically consolidate and compare, make sure that if there's something showing up that you spent on your end, that they're not reflecting on their end or vice versa, that you are calling them or sending that email and saying, you know what, I have this expenditure that I don't see on your end. And, and sometimes mistakes happen on either side. Maybe they had a mistype in the amount, maybe they left out a digit, or maybe you had accidentally coded it differently um, and they should, if they're going to be, they, if they need to change a code, if they're uncertain, they should be reaching out to you and not doing it automatically. Um, but that's where that good relationship really comes into play because I have heard of, of that happening before where uh, the department, the financial department would just say, oh, well, I know they meant to put this as a consumer service or a participant um, service. And so they just go ahead and change it on their end 
but that shouldn't be happening. And that's where you can catch those kinds of things and have those conversations and discussions um, if necessary to, to make sure that the, that communication is open and they, they reach out to you and make sure you have approval or there are steps established as to how to make a correction. If, whether it's coded incorrectly on the program's end or on finances end, there should be steps established as to how do we now fix that rather than just a verbal, yeah, go ahead and fix that or them doing it on their own. So the systems are really important to put into play. So those reports that you should be getting from your accounting department or finance department should have every detail that you included, for instance, on your check request or your purchase order request. It should um, have the date, the description, the consumer ID number that you've established, confidential ID number, if that's how you list your consumer services that are sent in for check requests and POs. Um, the, the amount, the vendor, if it's going to a specific vendor, the description of what it is, because you may use the same vendor for multiple things. So there has to be some detail in there that can help you distinguish one, one charge from the other. And then your drawdowns are really important as well. Um, again, that should be something that's regularly happening. The more frequently, the better. It's easier to, to catch and fix mistakes if it's more frequently you should be reviewing those before they happen and approving them. And again, checks and balances, making sure that the amount that they're asking to draw down versus what you are expecting to be drawn down matches up. And that's a good way to catch, maybe we have six checks that we were expecting for, to send out for vendors in a given week. And if the amount that I'm expecting, the combination of those checks um, isn't the amount that they're saying to draw down with personnel and, and benefits and those other maybe frequent um, drawdowns. If those numbers don't add up, then right away you can say what's missing. What is maybe a check that got left out? Maybe they didn't get it in their system like I thought they did, kind of uh, checks and balances. And so um, other reports that might be useful are um, the itemization of grant expenditures and obligations relative to the budget, as well as itemized reports showing in-kind cash match. Um, documenting those and having those on hand for the audits, again, is very important. And so if the finance department has a report that they give you as well for that, sometimes you might get a um, quarterly report or it might be monthly and making sure, again, that those lines that line up with what you are documenting on your end and that they're consistent. So a CUF account is um, not all programs use them, but it can be very helpful and it can be very similar to um, that check register. It could be either on a spreadsheet like on Excel. Um, it's really helpful if it if the tribes programs all use a similar version. It's not required, but if maybe there are um, other programs that have different CUF account setups, it's more likely that there might be some uh, confusion within the finance department or more likely to have um, some mistakes or omissions. But if they're consistent department to department and they're being turned in maybe to somebody else to give a second glance over it, then it's more easy to see if there are any things that are needing corrections. But again, it's not required. So it can help you to keep track rather than maybe just having paper and pencil versions and electronic version can be very helpful. And let me see real fast if I can pull up a different screen here and show you an example. Give me just a second. Let me see if I can pull that up real fast. So this is a very basic just example right here. Give me just a second to see. QuickBooks is um, a good um, program. Let's see if this is the one. There we go. So 
Yes, and I know some programs do use QuickBooks. Um, and sometimes, depending on your IT department availability and capacity, they might develop something more high tech that's internal. And so just a general documentation of which line item it might come from, you know, instead of invoice number here in this column, it could be um, in added in also that there's the check number or the PO number, um, or there might be another tracking number here instead of invoice number, depending on your vendor and what the, what the activity is. And um, you can have it where there's a total, let's see, I don't think that it has it down here, that it keeps track of an overall total. And if you do it in say Excel, you can have little tabs here along the bottom, like you can have one sheet that's the overall. Um, do you want me to share the example summary? that we have? Sure. We have an example in the toolkit if you want me to share. Oh, okay. Yes. I think I grabbed this from one of Sorry. the other yeah. no, that's... PowerPoints. And um, so, and then with the little tabs, you can break those down into those fun codes. And it's really handy to have just the exact to the penny amount that you have available. Um, yes, there you go. Those different tabs down there at the bottom, yep. like I was talking about. And Oops. then um, depending on who is managing that, you might be able to have it where certain people are able to add that information in, maybe the director and say an administrative assistant, or if there's a, um, a position within the department that would help to handle this. And that way it's got two sets of eyes even within the department. Um, and say if somebody's out for a couple of days, then the other person's able to keep it up to date as the, those expenditures um, are taking place. Thank you. And again, like Beth said, just in interest of time, we will um, hold off on the questions for the moment. I don't think I've gone back to sharing my screen yet. There we go. Okay. So, and again, this is just another possible way of checking back with finance and comparing those reports that they give to you and making sure that things line up according to what you thought were going on your account for expenditures. So many of this, I know in a lot of other webinars and um, different trainings and meetings, we've talked a lot about confidentiality. And this is important even in financial management because um, you wanna make sure that things are being coded correctly in terms of going to, if you have a consumer services line item, then anything with a, a consumer ID most likely would fall under that line item. But we don't want to say, okay, we're buying this and paying for this tuition and buying these books and these supplies or this clothing for interviews and have finance know exactly who you're talking about. It's important to make sure that we're protecting their privacy, um, the fact that they're a participant in the program. And one way to do that is to develop a code um, for that consumer ID. Um, and people do it a number of different ways. It's not recommended to do their or include their social security number, even the last four digits. Um, some do it, they include maybe certain um, numbers or letters based on maybe which county that person is in. And then you have to talk about things like, well, even if they move into another county, they keep that same ID number sort of decision that you guys would have to make in your own program to make sure that tracking is easy and it makes sense for your program. Uh, but not so easy that in finance department that they would automatically say, well, we know who this is. We know somebody who recently got a, a wheelchair ramp on their car and now we can match up that ID number and it makes sense because we can crack that code basically. Um, hopefully that wouldn't be happening with within that department, but we have heard stories. I've heard stories of people that say, you know, their finance department has come to them and said, well, we want to know why this person is getting this service. And the only way they were able to figure that out was based on the purchase orders or the check requests. And even with an ID number, they perhaps were able to figure that out. 
So you wanna take into consideration if you don't already have a strong way of protecting confidentiality in terms of what you turn into finance, um, you want to establish that. And sometimes it's even, um, again, going back to that relationship, sometimes understanding them, understanding on their end why we do certain things makes all the difference. If we come to them and say, basically, this is what we're doing and you don't need to ask questions, you don't need to understand, then a lot of times that cannot help the relationship much. But if we give it to them in a matter of, um, you know, that we're required to protect their confidentiality for one thing, but that they would want their friends and family members to be protected as well. Because sometimes we would have situations that I've heard of where um, the finance department or administration wanted to have the quotes um, that we should have quotes, but they wanted that to still have the participants contact information on it or their, their number, um, like say a phone number or their name, because they were wondering, well, how did we know that those quotes really match up to that check request? And so um, sharing that information with the department and explaining to them that we still can't share it even on quotes is really important as well. So widening out that information and replacing it with the ID, the consumer ID number, will help to further protect their confidentiality. And then inventory management, oops, sorry about that, went one too far. Inventory management, um, a lot of times we buy a lot of equipment, whether it be for our office use, whether it be for participant use, and it's important to track that um, for our expenditures, as well as if we are giving uh, or allowing somebody to use, say, a laptop. Right now, this is very significant for a lot of our programs where um, we need to still be able to keep in touch with our consumers in a variety of ways. Maybe they were still in a training program. Maybe their employer needs to keep in touch with them. Um, and a lot of us were working from home or otherwise not able to be contacted in our usual way or carry out our work or training duties in our usual way. So it's important if we have maybe loaner laptops that we're issuing out um, and it, we have an agreement that we're tracking, that we're having those serial numbers, we have inventory for our office in general as well that we um, from time to time compare to what finance and maybe our IT departments have uh, we don't want to be charged for something that we didn't actually have, or if it was perhaps outdated and got disposed of, that needs to be all documented. We need to keep good records for our accountability and for our audit purposes. So we do have in the toolkit a number of examples um, for uh, like inventory, agreement forms and tracking. Oops, let me go get to that real fast. And I'm sorry, I don't know how to toggle from one to the other very well, apparently. So I'm going to try to pull up, let's see. So here is an agreement. Can you see that or do I need to reshare? You need to reshare. Okay. Yeah, I'm not grabbing it the right way, it looks like, but I, I had it pulled up. Let's see. Here we go. I think this is, did I get it there? Yes. All right. So this is one example of several resources in the financial toolkit. Um, and again, you would want to tailor this for what would work in your agency. Maybe your finance department or your administration wants certain things documented on an agreement such as this, but this is just a guide. And this and many, many other links are in the financial toolkit. So I encourage you to take a look at those. And in interest of time, I will skip showing the other ones at the moment, but that is, I believe, where it picks back up with you, Beth. Mm -hmm. Yep, thank you. Um, I just wanted to, uh, Lee was asking if there were any guidelines for programs set up as a consortia with one tribe serving as a lead. So I don't think in the toolkit we covered that. This is really designed to be a pretty basic financial management toolkit. Um, I would have to double check on that, Lee, but um, you know, if Avertech has any 
things that they want to share that should be in the toolkit, we'd be happy to stick that in there for the um, consortia because that that is a you know issue with one tribe who might be financially responsible for the whole grant. Um, so let me. Um, All right, so can everyone see my PowerPoint? <laughs> just make sure that, okay. Um, so the next thing that we wanted to talk about was just a little bit about regulatory criteria. And, um, you know, Winona has gone over some of this already. Um, but in the toolkit, we provide information about both the um, part 371, which is the tribal voc rehab part or AAVRS part of the regulations, as well as that uniform guidance or the 2 CFR part 200. And I will also not share my terms for those, <laughs> for the uniform guidance. Um, and uh, like Winona said, I'm just going to skip this, but basically, you know, it supersedes all of those circulars and so putting it in one place um, and then just a little bit more about allowable allocable and reasonable costs and so um, we have a we have a document in the toolkit um, if i can find it that um, talks about alloc allowable, allocable, and reasonable costs. So these are the three things that you need to keep in mind. So allowable costs are really looking at both 2 CFR 200 and also the 34 CFR 371 um, to make sure that the cost that you are charging to the grant is allowable within those guidelines. And so a lot of times what you're looking at is expenditures for the delivery of your services, expenditures for the administration of your of your grant and the agency, expenditures for staff development, and expenditures for culturally related services. And if you provide services to individuals outside of your service area, so remember when you're writing the grant, you define the service area that you're serving, um, that would be an example of an, a prohibited or non-allowable cost. And so we just provide a little bit more information about allowable costs. The term reasonable just means that are they reasonable? And so costs that are reasonable must not exceed what a sensible person would pay for a service or item. So there's really not a cap on what's reasonable. And as a tribal program and as a director, you need to figure out, is this a reasonable cost for something? And so this is really, you know, if, if um, I buy something in the Pacific Northwest, it may cost my program more than if Rachel paid for something in Oklahoma, just because of those cost of living differences. And so what might be reasonable for the Samish tribal program may be really different from you know, a tribal program somewhere else in a different part of the country. And so you just need to justify that and make sure it makes sense to you on that reasonable. And then allocable relates to can, you know, is it just used for your program? So in order to be allocable, and this is embedded in that uniform guidance um, principles, it needs to be incurred specifically for your agency. So it's, um, you know, something that your agency is using, it benefits your TVR agency, um, and it's necessary to the overall operation of the agency and is assignable in part. And so let's say it's rent. And so if you could identify square footage and you're, you're charging a particular piece of the rent that's not included in your indirect or overhead costs, if you are being charged you know, rent, it's, allow, it's allocable if you're just spending the portion that your agency occupies. It would not be allocable if you're paying the whole building rent and there's other programs in that building, for example. And so that's just a little bit about the allocable. And there's a really good resource that it's not tribal focused, but it's a good resource that just explains allowable, allocable, and reasonable. And so there's the link to the Dartmouth College webpage on that. So let me go back to the power, oh, did I go back to the PowerPoint? <laughs> no. Okay. 
Um, and so, you know, what you want to think about are those three principles anytime that you are um, doing some cost shares or, you know, making an expense. Um, like I said, there are some instances when private approval is required, and so they're really in that uniform guidance. In the toolkit, we do have some descriptions of what those prior approval for expenditures might be. Um, so for a lot of times it's food. So for the, you know, with the Tribal Vic Rehab Institute, when we bring our advisory board in, if we want to provide food, we need to ask for prior approval and usually they tell us no, but you know, that's an example of a prior approval uh, process. And then procurement is another thing. So this is when you're procuring or getting some equipment or getting something um, from you know, another organization. And so again, we're looking at the uniform guidance. So those two CFR 200 standards and the processes differ depending upon the expenditure amount. And this is also where you need to make sure that you're working with your tribal office because sometimes tribes are more restrictive than the federal guidelines. So I just want to show you a graphic that the Office of Management and Budget has um, provided and this is also in the toolkit. And so this is just an example of when the process for procurement. And so they consider micro purchases $3,500 or under, and so you don't need any quotes, and you can, you know, purchase those that um, whatever uh, service or equipment that you're purchasing. Um, small purchases up to 150,000, you do need rate quotes, but you don't need to do an in-depth cost analysis. Um, and then it starts getting more and more restrictive as you go up. Um, as uh, it goes greater than 150,000. Um, and so if it's a construction project, then it's in that sealed bid. If it's um, fixed cost or cost reimbursement, that's competitive proposals. So that's what you guys are part of. And then sole source is where that is unique um, or a public emergency. But for tribal programs, it's that unique. And so cultural and or traditional VR services are in that sole source category. And so for instance, if you were trying to provide a traditional or cultural VR service, you don't need to go out and get quotes. You can you know, go to the person through informed choice or through your knowledge of people who provide those services and it can be considered that sole source. Um, and then Sherry, thank you. I, I used rent as an example. It was probably a bad example, but um, Sherry just pointed out that you can't use rent as match in kind or allowable expense unless all others in the department or program in the building are also paying rent. And so her example was that the VR program cannot be charged rent if the 477 program down the hall doesn't pay. So thank you for pointing that out. That's an interesting distinction. All right, so basically for procurement, you wanna make sure that you, you know, know the steps, both on the tribal part of it and then making sure that you're meeting the federal guidelines for procurement. So I'm gonna turn it back over to Rachel to talk about fiscal protocols and policies. Second to pull this back up to share it, I should say. And I need to learn how to do it where it's already in that big screen mode. Let's see if this is this has got it. Nope. Hold on. I think what happened was I have two of these open. So let me just scroll through here. There we go. All right, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Great. So um, there are always gonna be the need for the, the protocols, the policies and procedures, and the tribe generally has um, some of their own, and then there needs to be some specific to the VR program as well. Um, if you aren't tracking and uh, documenting the expenditures, 
whether it be within the program or in the finance department um, appropriately, then there could be, depending on the situation, uh, a requirement of RSA for the tribe to pay back some of those federal dollars. So by having those procedures in place and making sure that they're being carried out effectively and efficiently, then that would be less likely to happen. And we don't want to have any programs to have to pay back any funds to RSA. So that good communication and, and following through with the established guidelines that the program develops with their finance department and good communication with RSA if there are hiccups um, or need clarification needs, then, then that can avoid the payback situation. Um, and again, working really well with the financial staff um, and making sure, you know, we might think that certain things make sense on our end as a program, but making sure that financially in terms of, you know, accounting purposes and accounting terms um, that we really lean on them for some of their expertise as well. And we may have to tweak what we thought was going to be our policy and procedure to make sure that it flows well between the programs. Um, if we create a policy or procedure and it doesn't translate well to the accounting system that maybe they have in their office, um, there just might need to be some additional communication on the best way to approach it. And on our end, you know, explaining to them so many things about tribal VR that together you might be able to find the best system that's going to work for you and still follow the guidelines from RSA and the guidelines for the tribe overall, like, like Beth was talking about as far as procurement steps. Um, there are some things then and guidelines within the tribe as a whole that we want to make sure that we're still following as well. Next slide here. So we talked a little bit about uh, participant confidentiality and we want to make sure that the services that we're providing are necessary for the consumer, for the participant. Um, that's something that's important to have if it's somebody that's already established and it's in their IPE that we're putting necessary services in the IPE, not just going and buying a whole bunch of supplies for somebody that it's not relevant to their disability needs, their, their employment needs, their training needs, or whatever the case may be. Um, so it has to be specific to them and in their IPE and necessary. And if it's something that is um, maybe an evaluation to develop the plan ahead of time and establish what their employment goal is going to be, or if it's to establish eligibility, um, those things also need to be necessary. We wouldn't be utilizing our funds to send somebody to a whole bunch of different evaluations um, if it's not even going to be relevant to what we're trying to figure out for that particular person. Um, it's important to always explore our comparable services and resources that are available. It's not required to utilize them every time they are available because it might not be um, reasonable, perhaps if that service is there, but maybe it's not going to be available for, for example, for six months. And we're trying to get that individual in their training program or employment goal much quicker. We're taking the steps toward it. So it would be allowable for us to go ahead and provide a service, even if there's another uh, program that could provide that service, if it's not reasonable to have that other program, or maybe not for some reason appropriate for that participant to go with that program. Um, an example I can think of, just a general one, is perhaps there's, a, there's only one state office in the area and uh, the person wants to have a shared case with DRS, but there maybe has been conflict before with that particular worker. And at the time, they're the only one available. So maybe some services that previously were planned to be shared with the state or, or maybe another agency, not necessarily the state VR, for some reason that participant isn't comfortable going to that office any longer or um, a number of different reasons why we may provide the service even though there is a comparable service available. The important thing is to explore those services and see if it's feasible to go ahead and move forward with them. And then um, again, the allocable, allowable, and reasonable. We have to make sure that all of that is documented um, in our client expenditures as well as agency purchases for the office and things of that nature. 
And then systems of accountability for preventing fraud. Um, that's important in, in the sense of, for one thing, audits a lot of times will ask the program, uh, do you feel like there's a good system in place for the tribe and the program? Do you think that there's opportunity or have been instances of fraud? Sometimes you're going to be asked that in an audit. So having those systems in place and knowing that system is working well for the program and the tribe is very important as well. Um, verifying that when you have uh, had a check, for instance, for a vendor, that if it's floating out there lost in the mail somewhere, that that is noticed and followed up on. Um, we don't want you know, a lot of things to just be where we think that that money has been spent and then it actually hasn't cleared the bank or things of that nature. So making sure that there's that checks and balances on that end as well, as far as making sure that um, those expenditures have taken place, have, have actually come to fruition and that we can validate that on our budget expenses that it has in fact taken place. And how are we on time? I wanna look real fast because we're getting kind of close, right? Yeah, we're right at okay. 1.30. So that's why I'm, I'm just yep. kind of breezing through it real quick. But again, this, this toolkit has a lot more details and it, this is an overview, but um, we want to make sure that we are serving as many people as possible for our program and is reasonable that we proposed, but um, that we're doing it in a responsible way and that we're tracking it in a responsible way so that we can make sure that we're using our dollars wisely, uh, their federal dollars, and we want to reach out and develop those relationships with other programs in our area as well that can complement our services and best support our, our um, participants to help them to get to their goal. So having those, um, those systems set up can help us do that more effectively. And it's always important to make sure that we're keeping in mind conflict of interest. And that's where our policies and procedures can be so helpful, um, especially in a lot of our small communities that people that come into our office, often we know them very well. So if somebody comes in and is related, then we should have already an established procedure for how do we handle this? Um, who's going to possibly take that case and how are we going to work out things such as signatures and approvals so that there is not the possibility of someone thinking a conflict of interest came into play. Um, so if you don't have those kinds of procedures already established, then that's very important for, for tracking of the finances as well. Like Nona was saying, somebody um, who was put basically on blast for possible misuse of funds, you definitely don't want to lose that trust in your community and having those expenditures tracked and the appropriate signatures and not somebody who somebody might say is a conflict of interest overseeing those kinds of expenditures for the program can make all the difference. Um, and then there are a number of different steps that you can build in there if you aren't sure of something and as far as with while still maintaining confidentiality just because you're seeking some input from somebody else possibly outside of the program doesn't mean you're necessarily breaking confidentiality there there can be some really um, good and creative ways to still seek that counsel and get some advice without being specific about the case and then case sharing with the different programs a lot of us are really good at this and if we don't currently have a good relationship in our area with some of the other agencies are working on that. Um, and there are examples of different MOUs that are available for states and tribal VRs to use. Again, it's a requirement to work with the state. The state is supposed to be working with us. It's not a requirement for the participants if they don't want to for their particular case. Um, that's a different story. But as far as we hear stories of people coming to our offices saying, well, the state told me because I'm tribal that I have to come to the tribal VR and that's not correct and not appropriate. They have the option just like any other resident of that state to utilize the state VR services. And in a lot of cases, it's in their best interest. Even if they're not really on board necessarily right away, we can share with them the benefits and leave it up to them. But we have to um, do our best to 
work well with the other agencies. So it's to the benefit of our consumers as well as um, utilizing our dollars as best as possible. All right, I'm going to stop there because I don't want to take up the very end of the time if we have any questions. I kind of breezed through that, sorry. Does anyone have any questions? I think um, most of the ones were answered up above. I just had more time. <laughs> yeah, I just wish, yeah, it's very, very imperative that all the tribal VR programs log in and finish the toolkit. I think it's really, really a great toolkit that every single program can benefit from. So please log in and so it's a sign in, right? You log in, you sign in and can you just kind of explain the process of it at the beginning? Yeah, yeah I, I'm not sure because I, you know, I have an account through Canvas, but I think it's just a link that anyone can access. I don't think you need to sign in okay. for it. So I think we made it as an open Canvas link. Um, but if anyone has trouble, please let me know and we can, you know, troubleshoot that. Um, yep. Well, I would have any questions or recommendations. We tried to fit as much info in here. I don't think we're going to have time for the little case studies that I wanted to do, but I think that's okay. <laughs> we can save that for another time. Yeah, so Carol, um, I'm going to send the PowerPoint slide to Winona, and then she can okay. send it out. And in the PowerPoint slide, it has that link. Mm -hmm. And I'll send And Rachel just shared it again in the chat. So, yep. What I'm going to do is to send up a follow up email to everyone that includes uh, a video recording of this presentation, as well as the survey, any information that was shared in this presentation will also go out all in that one email. Thank you. Lee, do you have anything to say? Yes, um, first of all, I'd like to recognize the co-presenters for their wealth of knowledge, um, the ability to share what they know and what they feel will work best for your program. I do hope that another opportunity will occur like really fast for us to partner again and mm -hmm. to work with the Avers programs out there. But don't let um, our training or TA schedule hold you back from contacting either the TVR Institute staff or the Aver, or Avertech staff. Thank you again. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Lee. And you know, behind the scenes, we've been working with Avertech, you know, some, but not as much as Lee and I had hoped that we would. But yeah, so this is great. Okay, oh. you guys. Sherry, have a real fast. Sherry had said that she tried to get on the link, and it just takes you to Canvas. So Sherry, we'll work on on how to figure out a way that people can access that without a Canvas account. I thought that it was on the website. Yeah where it was um, taking you right into it, but we'll figure that out and send it to Nona since she's sending out the email. Okay. okay. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Either tonight or tomorrow. I have a, I have a couple meetings after this. So. Yes. <laughs> tomorrow, I'll send out that email just so you know. You guys Thanks, take everyone. care. We're thinking about you. Don't hesitate to call your Institute and Avertech again. We're here for you. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Yep. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you, everyone. Bye.